Okay guys, uh, good morning, uh, or good whenever you're watching this. Uh, I was asked to go over our most recent protocol quiz, and so uh, that's what we're going to do. So I got the quiz up here. Uh, let's take a look. So question number one says uh, that you're treating a 60-year-old male with a previous episode of substernal chest pain and current ST depressions on his EKG. And it asks you, what, what should you do? And select all that apply. So the key word here is previous episode of substernal chest pain. What that means is that he doesn't have current pain. So uh, anything that we are going to give to treat pain is not indicated if he doesn't have a current complaint of pain. So uh, with that in mind, he does have current ST depressions on his EKG. We should suspect... Uh, that there is uh, something cardiac going on, and we should treat that, but we do not need to treat pain. So with that in mind, O2 titrated to maintain SpO2. Yeah, that's appropriate. Um, current AHA guidelines suggest to maintain SpO2 greater than or equal to 90% in patients with ACS. That's appropriate care. Aspirin 324 PO, also appropriate. Aspirin, remember, is not used to treat pain. It's used to inhibit platelet aggregation, right? Um, it affects thromboxane A2. It inhibits the, the uh, ability of thromboxane A2 to do its thing and uh, cause platelet aggregation. And so absolutely, we, we will use aspirin. Uh, nitroglycerin is not indicated. The end point of nitroglycerin therapy is relief of pain. That's been achieved. So nitroglycerin is not indicated. Nitroglycerin has not been shown to improve outcomes in patients with ACS. Its sole use is as an analgesic, as a pain reliever. Uh, fentanyl, same thing. Also not indicated. This patient does not have a current complaint of pain, and so uh, fentanyl not indicated. Uh, okay, uh, so then uh, question number two. Uh, we have a blood pressure of 150, and the question is, what is the MAP? So remember the formula for MAP is the, the, and the idea of MAP, right? The mental model to have is it's the average blood pressure in the patient's system over time. So uh, if the patient's MAP, if, if the patient's, uh, the blood pressure is made up of, of systole and diastole, right? So um, the idea of MAP is that the patient's in diastole about twice as much as they're in systole, and so we're going to weight the diastole twice what we weight the systole. So uh, we're going to take the systolic, and to that we'll add two times the diastolic, and then we're going to divide the whole thing by three. So here the systolic is 100, the diastolic is 50, two times 50 is 100, so we have 200, we'll divide 200 by three, 200 divided by three is 66 point seven, so 67 it rounds to. Okay, so let's look at question number three. Question number three says that you're going to give amiodarone to a patient with pulse filler perfusing. Okay, so uh, we're going to give amiodarone to a patient with pulse full monomorphic VTAC uh, at the dose according to the protocol. So the question is just what's the protocol dose? This is a simple protocol question. Either you know it or you don't. Our protocol dose for perfusing VTAC is 150 milligrams given as a drip over 10 minutes. So you either knew it or you didn't. Um, okay, now we're gonna use a macro drip to deliver that dose. This is a, I would suggest to you guys, this is a, um, a drip rate that's just worth memorizing. It's five drops every three seconds, five drops every three seconds. Uh, but if you needed to calculate that, uh, this, this is how you do it. Um, you would go, Okay, uh, we have 100 milliliters of D5, and we're going to drip in that 100 milliliters of D5 over 10 minutes. So um, that means we're going to do 10 milliliters per minute, right? That will uh, give us the 100 milliliters over the full 10 minutes. So, okay, uh, if there's... Uh, 10 drops for every milliliter, that means we need to give 100 drops each minute. So that's 100 divided by 60. If you just reduce that fraction, it comes down to 5 over 3. 
Okay, uh, question number five asks, what's the appropriate volume of crystallized fluids to give on standing orders to a hemodynamically stable patient? So that means they got a good blood pressure, good mental status with the rhythm pictured. Now that rhythm uh, you should recognize as uh, AFib with RVR. And the reason you should know that is because this has this uh, wavy stochastic baseline. You have irregularly irregular QRS complexes, and obviously it's quite fast. And uh, the thing to know about this is if you look at your AFib with RVR protocol, what it says is that uh, 10 cc's per kilo is a medical control option. If 10 cc's per kilo is a medical control option, that means that you cannot give any on standing orders. So if they, if they list it as a medical control option, that means they're not expecting you to do any on standing orders. And this makes sense. We don't want to uh, fluid overload patients whose hearts are not working well. Okay, so question number six, uh, which of the below are medical control options for treatment of radiant dysrhythmia? Well, um, this is another straight protocol question. You either knew it or you didn't. But if you know a little bit about pharmacology, you can kind of deduce what the answer would be. So of the listed drugs, atropine, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, uh, three of the four are uh, drugs that we think of as having... Um, so yeah, uh, three of these four drugs have uh, chronotropic effects, um, at least strong, chron rel relatively strong chronotropic effects, and one of them really is primarily alpha and does not have chronotropic effects. So if we're treating brady dysrhythmia, we want to give a drug that is a chronotrope. So uh, drugs that are chronotropes here are atropine, dopamine, and epinephrine. Norepinephrine, in contrast, is really primarily alpha. It's not really a chronotrope. So uh, that drug you would not expect to find in the uh, Brady dysrhythmia protocol. Uh, and in fact, that's true. We, we do not use norepi to treat Brady dysrhythmias. All right, question number seven is a pure protocol question. You either knew it or you didn't. And uh, the indications for calcium chloride under our protocols are suspected hype. Okay, cardizem. Uh, you just had to know this. Cardizem is a calcium channel blocker. We use it to control or to suppress uh, conduction through the AV node during AFib with RVR. So um, it's a calcium channel blocker. All right. Looking at number nine, amiodarone. Uh, again, this is you either knew it or you didn't, but uh, you need to know what kind of drugs you're giving to your patients and what they do. So amiodarone is a beta blocker, it is a sodium channel blocker, it is a calcium channel blocker, and it is a potassium channel blocker. It is all of these things. Uh, and, and you definitely do need to know that. You need to, to know what to expect your drugs to do as you give them to your patients. So um, you either knew it or you didn't, but if you didn't, now you do. Uh, okay, um, so, so number 10, is asking which med you would give first to a patient in cardiac arrest with this rhythm. Well, this rhythm is is VFib, and it's a little bit of a trick question because you didn't really need to know the rhythm at all. The rhythm is a little bit of a distractor here. Uh, any patient in arrest, the first drug they get is epinephrine. So hopefully you knew that. Um, okay, now we do need to know the rhythm because uh, we're, we're asked about the second medication to give to the patient. And of the listed options, uh, lidocaine is the only one we would give. So when we have a shockable arrest rhythm, the second medication we give is an antidysrhythmic. So um, options, with the antidysrhythmics we use for shockable arrest rhythms are all sodium channel blockers. And the two that we have to choose from are amiodarone and lidocaine. And amiodarone is enlisted, so lidocaine is the choice to go with. Finally, um, were asked which intervention is indicated for the patient of these electrical therapies. And because this is uh, VFib, there's no way the patient has a pulse. Defibrillation is indicated. If they're in VFib, they get the defib. Okay, number 13, we have SVT. Hopefully you recognize that as SVT. There's no P waves, the rates above 150, narrow QRS complexes. That makes it SVT. Uh, but the patient's hemodynamically stable. So then the question is, what's the appropriate initial medication? And the answer there is adenosine. 
stable SVT, your patient gets adenosine. Question number 14. Uh, this is an interesting rhythm. So you have narrow QRS complexes, but complete dissociation between P waves and QRS complexes. So this is a third degree heart block. And uh, if it's a third degree heart block, uh, the uh, expectation is going to be that our atropine is not going to fix this problem. And the reason for that is atropine works by inhibiting vagus nerve impulses. And the vagus nerve does not really run to the ventricles. The medical term for that is innervate. The vagus nerve does not really innervate the ventricles. So uh, whatever we do to the vagus nerve really is only going to affect the atria. So um, that being the case, we're told the patient's hemodynamically unstable. Uh, he's in this rhythm, which is a slow, complete heart block. Uh, and the intervention to provide is transcutaneous pacing. Right? So brady bradycardic patients get paced, tachycardic patients will either get cardioverted or defibrillated depending on circumstances. Okay, so question number 15 is is uh, the, probably the most difficult question of the set. You needed to have the most knowledge uh, in order to answer this. Just zoom out a little bit here. So the patient has... Um, an empty bottle of amitriptyline next to them. Uh, so the first thing you need to know is that amitriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant. And when we have patients that overdose on tricyclic antidepressants, what uh, we typically see is uh, inhibition of or interference with those patients' sodium channels. So we get uh, disease of the sodium channels. We'll call that channelopathy. And so the way that we want to treat uh, sodium channelopathy is by increasing the serum sodium levels. That will help us to um, uh, help. That, that will help us to um, restore normal function in the cardiac membrane. So uh, sodium bicarb is going to be our front line here. Uh, as well, uh, mag sulfate is appropriate, particularly if this patient's QT interval is prolonged, which we would expect it to be. Uh, so mag sulfate is another, is another option here. Uh, the drug that is absolutely contraindicated would be amiodarone. And the reason that amiodarone is contraindicated is because amiodarone prolongs the QT interval. So if your problem is that your QT interval is too long, amiodarone is going to make it worse. So um, th think of it this way. Um, the amitriptyline is causing disease. It's messing up the sodium channels, right? Uh, if we give a sodium channel blocker to sodium channels that are already messed up, it's going to uh, cause the patient to brady down and eventually go asystolic. That's that's sort of the thought process there. And um, if you if you want more information on that, uh, I will link a video uh, talking about really wide complex tachycardia, uh, which is what this is, and uh, how sodium channel blockers are dangerous for those patients. Um, so I'll put that in the comments below. Okay, uh, that's all I had for you guys. Uh, good luck with your studying. Uh, keep your head in the protocols, and uh, I'll see you soon.